Number six. There's one thing further, which does not a little aggravate the, e the evil of this incorporating union with the prelatic constitution of England. And it seems so plain that I presume none will refuse it, namely, that when the union was in agitation, not a few of the ministers of this church, especially the leading men thereof, got, many, got money to lend a list and consummate that woeful union. I instance this, not because it is a vulgar opinion in city and country never refuted, but because both Carnwath and his memoirs, who, tis presumable, had pretty good access to know the truth of this matter, tells the world that such a thing was done, and condescends upon a certain quota given to each, which has never been publicly disowned by the ministers foresaid, and also several of these money ministers have confessed, when challenged about it, that they got five hundred mercs, and nobody will think that they would lie of their own purse. If this shall be denied, I can give their names and places of residence who have owned this, but I am unwilling to expose them. This seems to cast as strange, uh, excuse me, this seems to cast up as a strange kind of simony, and even exceeds the treachery of that arch traitor Bishop Sharp, who out of a greed of filthy lucre betrayed the Church of Scotland, seeing these gentlemen have both betrayed and sold the Church and nation for the same. If it be objected that this money was got from the government upon the account of their, the loss their friends sustained at the ruin of Darien, I answer, this does not a whit mend the matter, but renders it more vile. In regard, England's preferring that money of purpose to repair Scotland's loss at Darien was a chief, if not the only bait, that drew Scotland into that treaty, which seems to be the most bare-faced temptation that ever was made to a people or nation, and if anything under the sun should have driven Scotland into an abhorrence of the Union, it was this, I mean, England's proferring money to recompense that Darien loss, which, upon the matter, was a plain acknowledgment that they had murdered our brethren and broken there and our trade there, as is too well known they did. Not that I was any way interested in it, or I think it was without God first and last, yet, consequentially, such as received that money foresaid, even upon that consideration, sold not only the church and state, but also that public trade and seeming prosperity of the nation, and the blood of their friends and dear re relations to the bargain, yet have not enriched themselves in the price thereof. If ministers, etc., behooved to have this Caledonian loss refunded, it would have been more honorable to have supplicated the Parliament of Scotland craving that some additional cess, imposition, or something like the two pennies upon the, po the pint of ale should have been exacted to recompense this loss, in which case we should have remained a free kingdom, than to have made merchandise of a free church and kingdom for such a base end. I need not say, because too well known, that since such a bloody bargain commenced, this poor nation as far surmounted the equivalent, by paying impositions, taxations, etc. Yet we're as far from being freed from that insupportable yoke of the incorporating union with England and its concomitants, as at first, when the nation entered into it, a yoke that neither our fathers nor we were able to bear, as appears from the Acts of Parliament cited in our National Covenant. Quote, but can a nation that has broken covenant with God expect to prosper when the Lord has sworn by himself or his own life that they shall not prosper or be delivered? Unquote. Ezekiel 17, verses 15 and 18. But second, it is evident from the foresighted memoirs and recent in the memories of others that those ministers got the money before the union commenced with a design to the givers to, rend to render them silent at their proceedings, at least that they might say less against the same, which was effectually obtained, for they made no opposition after receipt of their premium to the conclusion of that sinful union, whereas the equivalent in compensating one of the Darien losses was to pay long after that woeful conclusion. Reason 7. I cannot see how Presbyterian dissenters should join with this revolution church, she, seeing she is of and improves toleration principles. Number 1. This appears from her not strenuously opposing from scripture and covenanted principles the enacting of that promiscuous and almost unbounded toleration, a woeful, envenomed fruit of the union, nor using proper and necessary means for getting it repealed and abolished since its commencement, though an intolerable grievance to all that have the glory of God and the advancement of Christ's kingdom at heart, wherein this degenerate church acts very unlike our zealous and faithful reformers, as appears from the testimony of ministers in the Shire of Perth and Fife against Cromwell's more limited toleration, as the enacting it 
seems to be iniquity established by a law, and an open and avowed matter. So a tame submission thereunto implies an approbation thereof. This is plain in regard all sects and sorts of persons, under what mold or shape soever, anti-Trinitarians and Papists, which last is now tolerated in England and Ireland, 1778, some way accepted, have by this toleration act a full and ample pass, and do from time to time improve it, to make whatever attacks and inroads upon our glorious Redeemer's kingdom and interests, to the advancement of Satan's and their own, they please, without check, which looks with a tremendous aspect and just cross to the Act of Assembly 1647, Session 29, entitled, Act Concerning the 111 Propositions and to the Acknowledgement of Sins and Engagement to Duties. Number two, as ministers of whom, these church, of whom this church consisted in the former period, supplicated for, accepted of, and improved, York's Popish toleration, and at the Revolution, sided with King William's toleration in favors of the curates, as above. So since the enacting of Queen Anne's vast toleration, anon 1712, continued in the past and present reign, this church continues to improve the same, in so far as, firstly, in obedience to the said toleration act, they allow their presenters to proclaim the Episcopalians, when required, who apply to their own curates for marriage, yea, when any of their own hearers, having proclaimed in the churches, applied to such curates for marriage, there is no censure inflicted in regard. The toleration screens them. Secondly, they insert in their records the names of the children baptized with the sign of the cross by such meeting house curates, whether more publicly or more privately, the money due for such registrations being given to the clerks of the kirks, whereby they are come to have one purse with the prelatists. Thirdly, in many ways they do not call in a judicial way before them persons of the Episcopal persuasion, guilty of fornication, etc., to make satisfaction according to the rules of the church. These sinful practices and omissions appear the more loathsome that they are done in obedience to and compliance with the iniquitous toleration. Number four. Fourthly, excuse me. What sinful silence and concurring with the rasty and sinful toleration in the state occurred in the church of late, when popery was established in Canada by Act of Parliament 1774 and tolerated in England and Ireland by seven, uh, in, and tolerated in England and Ireland 1778 and threatened or feared in Scotland? The General Assembly did not give so much as a faithful warning or testimony against the same. And though Mr. Giles made a very laudable motion for that purpose, yet it was rejected on the whimming pretense that there was no present danger, and negatived by a 118 votes to 24, which was no small measure of abatement in their freedom used on former occasions in the year 1707 and 1712. Supine security and stupid compliances. Fifthly, they connive at great folks and others conforming with England when there, and with this church when here. Yea, they allow them to sit, speak, and vote in their judicatories as ruling elders or commissioners who not only baptize and communicate with both churches, which is a strange debauching of principles and what could not be allowed some time a day in Scotland, but also are guilty of taking the sacramental test, that is, the sacrament upon their knees before the altar, etc., a horrid abuse of that ordinance, which no Presbyterians can either go into or overlook. The tolerating of such sinful practices seems to render this church time and men servers, and is expressly contrary to the Holy Scriptures, quote, Thou shalt not suffer sin upon thy brother, unquote, etc. Leviticus 19, verse 17. And our confession of faith, particularly chapter 20, section 3, and chapter 30, sections 3 and 4. Number 3. This church hath never censured nor condemned Mr. Dunlop's erroneous preface to the Westminster Confession of Faith printed in 1719, which plainly pleads for, justifies and vindicates toleration, unbounded toleration, and is evidently condemned by the standards to which it is prefixed, and so should be removed, and that the rather, because it contains many unsound tenets and opinions, and several other gross errors, and, instead of justifying, does sadly betray Presbyterian principles. See the plain reasons against the same, printed 1722, and renders this church very naked, when he affirms on page 142, quote, that there is no active assembly, nor even of any inferior church judicator, 
establishing the confession of faith, a term of Christian com communion, and appointing ministers to require an assent thereto from Christian parents. Unquote. I won't say but the practice of ministers in many places confirms this relation, and shows they are of the same mind with the preface. Yet that a whole church should tolerate such a book and such practices is a confirmation of the assertion and reason why Presbyterian dissenters should or do see cause to dissent from this church. Number four. This church, by her silence at such a preface, hath not only approven of it and the things therein contained, but has given her amen to the injury done to our most excellent confession of faith by that addition, which hath purposely... Oh, which, is, which hath purposely, excuse me, left out of it the solemn league and covenant, the solemn acknowledgment of sins and engagement to duties, acts of assembly, approving the confession of faith and catechisms, some of saving knowledge, which are parts of the received standard, together with several other valuable things in use to be printed and bound with former editions of the said confession, as if this church were ashamed of our covenants, etc., or designed entirely to bury them, thereby to gratify malignance. Number five. Though the commission of the church to make an overture signifying that preface to be no deed of the church, yet in regard neither that nor any commission or assembly since have really condemned it or given any just testimony against the errors therein contained, it is and will be pos it, and will be by posterity, while the matter remains so, accounted the deed of the whole church, and that they approve of everything in it, especially considering what is said, page 162, in the advertisement of the preface foresaid, that is, quote, the Commission of the General Assembly, in pursuance of an order of the Assembly, did appoint a committee of ministers and ruling elders, among whom the gentleman who undertook the publishing of this edition was named, to take care that the confession of faith, catechisms, etc., might be rendered as correct and complete as might be, by the direction and assistance of which committee, the several amendments and alterations in this impression, mentioned in the above advertisement were made, which, tis hoped, will recommend this edition and give it a greater authority and weight than any other." Unquote. Now, as I can't see an agreement betwixt this recommendation of the Commission and the posterior overture above mentioned, but a plain clashing, so such unaccountable conduct may make a tender Christian cry out and say, as some, has, as some have already done, quote, Oh, how deplorable is our defection! when the doctrines and truths of God are thus corrupted and openly contradicted, when what errors and superstitions may not break in upon this land when so wide a door is set open for them, and these unchristian doctrines are joined to our confession of faith, how can we mourn enough for these things or sufficiently bear testimony against them? Surely the Lord has a great controversy against these lands that has permitted such poisonous notions to creep in and be so highly advanced." Unquote. Upon the whole, such as would desire to understand the evil of toleration principles and see them clearly confuted, may consult the Declaration of the Commission of the General Assembly, 1649, witnessing faithfully against such principles, while in the bud, the seasonable and necessary warning and declaration of the General Assembly, 1649, session 27, their brotherly exhortation to their brethren in England in the same year, the testimony of the ministers of the gospel in, Provident, in the providence of Perth and Fife, 1658, the Presbytery of Edinburgh's testimony and warning against toleration, 1659, Mr. James Rennick's testimony against the Duke of York's Popish toleration, 1688, and the 109th question of the larger catechism, where the Reverend Assembly of Divines, in their exposition of the Second Commandment, reckons the tolerating of false religions among the sins forbidden therein. The Confession of Faith, Chapter 23rd, Section 3rd, but especially, pondered Genesis, Chapter 18, Verse 19. Genesis 35, verses 1, 2, 3, and 4. 1 Samuel 3, verses 11 and 12 and 13 and 14. Psalm 101, verse 1. 1 Timothy 2, verses 2 and 3. John 10, verses 11 and 12. Titus 3, verses 10 and 11. Revelation 2, verses 6, 14, 15, 16, and 20. Deuteronomy 13, verses 6 and 11, etc. Joshua 22, verses 11 and 12. 1 Kings 18, verse 40, 2 Chronicles 15, verses 16 and 17, 1 Kings 12, verse 26, 2 Kings 17, verse 18, Ezekiel 23, verses 45 and 49, Amos 5, verse 13, Zechariah 13, verse 3, etc. Objection. Number 1. Presbyterian dissenters in Scotland 
have the benefit of the toleration as well as others, why then should they cry out against it? Answer. As I know no benefit they have by the toleration, so sure I am they plead as little favor from it. Some think whatever comes under the notion of a toleration, properly and strictly considered, falls at the same time under the notion of a crime. They judge their principles are founded on the word of God, and were approved to be so by the Church of Christ in Scotland in pure times, which were likewise ratified by many acts of Parliament, and consequently they must have their free pass, oppose them, must have their free pass, oppose them, or the owners of them who will. Neither is it on account of hurt or benefit that cry, uh, excuse me, that can accrue to dissenters by the toleration that they cry out against it, but purely on account of the great prejudice done thereby to the interest of Christ and the reformation of religion. I own, if the state had exerced, exercised their spite in the same manner that the church had done, Presbyterian dissenters long ago had got convincing proofs and the world demonstrative evidences that this church did not reckon them included in the toleration bill.